Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Jeff Grammer with the Albuquerque Journal, and this is the Talking Grammar Podcast, episode 83 now. I'm going to give you a little bit of a Mountain West tournament preview. going to recap just a few of the games from late last week to end the regular season of what was probably, in fact, in a lot of people's estimation, uh, the greatest or one of the very select few greatest seasons of the 25-year history of the Mountain West Conference for men's basketball. And I'm also going to go over the uh, Mountain West Media Awards, which were released today. As I record this, this is uh, on the night of Monday, March 11th. Mountain West Men's Basketball Tournament begins on Wednesday, March 13th in Las Vegas, Nevada, in UNLV's Thomas and Mack Center, uh, as most of you probably know by now. And it runs through Saturday's championship game, which will be broadcast on CBS Sports. First round games on Wednesday are all going to be streamed on the MW.com. The quarterfinal and semifinal rounds on Thursday and Friday are going to be broadcast on CBSSportsNetwork.com. And we're going to get over, uh, get to the matchups, the, the times of the games, and a lot more of the tournament stuff a little bit later in this podcast. First, I want to thank you not only for, for listening and watching um, on this podcast, but for subscribing and helping out local journalism at abqjournal.com. All the coverage we got going there and here on the podcast, abqjournal.com slash subscribe is how you can get there and subscribe to our digital products um, or our print products if you'd like. I also like to thank TLC Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. They are presenting this episode of the Talking Grammar podcast. And we got a lot of podcasts rolling out now. We got plenty of them on the Albuquerque Journal Podcast Network. Hope you're watching, giving some of those a chance. Um, you can go to the Albuquerque Journal's YouTube page to, to watch a bunch of them. We're also pushing them out on social media, stuff like that. But um, you are here now on the Talking Grammar podcast. So let's talk a little bit of uh, college basketball, Mountain West basketball, and most specifically for most of you, UNM Lobo basketball. I'm going to go back uh, the, the final weekend um, of the Mountain West season last last week. Started on a Friday night with Boise State playing at San Diego State. The reason I want to start there is because it had it went to overtime. Boise State won, clinched the uh, number three seed in the Mountain West tournament, and it featured just an unbelievably uh, crazy shot by Max Rice in overtime that helped Boise State seal the deal and clinch the clinch the win, the road win in Viejas Arena against San Diego State. Now, I say it's an unbelievable crazy shot unless you happen to be one of the 15,000 plus fans that was in the pit on January 31st and saw Max Rice go off for 35 points, a career high, and beat the Lobos with awkward shot after awkward shot after unbalanced shot after seemingly impossible miracle circus shot after circus shot which by now I think a lot of Lobo fans understand, and because he's in his, his fifth year, uh, I think a lot of people around the Mountain West understand by now, that's what Max Rice does. And uh, another guy who understands that is Donovan Dent. And it's something that came up in the press conference earlier today that uh, he, and, he and his teammates were watching that game. They were in Logan, Utah at the ho team hotel on Friday night when that game was being played, and uh, they were watching it. And when they saw that Max Rice shot, Donovan knew what was going, that it was about to go in. We're watching the boys San Diego State game, great game there. I mean, just a lot of fun in this league. Every team's good. So if you're watching that game, I got to ask about the Max Rice shot in overtime. He doesn't put the ball there. Neither does Max Rice, who heaves from that far and gets it. Max Rice, are you kidding me? What was the reaction of some of the guys watching that, thinking about what he did here? Me and Brady, as soon as he shot, I knew it was green. Like. As soon as I left the sand, we knew it was going in for sure. It was crazy. I've seen him hit it too many times. Like at this point, it's kind of a skill for him. It's kind of I kind of respect it. It really was like when he shot that. Like I was like, yeah, that's yeah, it. Did not surprise me at all. He had like three of those against us. I mean. <laughs> all right, so there you go. That was Donovan Dent. Uh, his uh, funny response when I when I asked him, you know, what do you think about that Max Rice shot? So obviously that uh, that shot um, helped them. Some Cam Martin free throws were also pretty big in it, but helped Boise State to a 79-77 win over San Diego State. They were ranked 21 at the time San Diego State was, and uh, that ended the regular season for the both of them. It got Boise State into the three-seed spot, uh, clinched uh, before the final four games, which were played on Saturday. For San Diego State, though, they had to wait until the next night when the Lobos played number 22 Utah State in Logan, Utah, to see where they would uh where they'd end up in the tournament bracket because they could have fallen the the defending champion 
uh, San Diego State Aztecs, went all the way to the national title game last year in the NCAA tournament, actually was waiting for the outcome of the UNM Lobo Utah State game to see if they were going to be the five seed in the Mountain West tournament this year or the six seed, meaning they'd have to play on the first day of the Mountain West tournament. I don't know when the last time they had to do that was, um, but it hasn't been very often over the past 15, 20 years. And I will tell you this, they are projected still to be a five seed probably in the NCAA tournament, and they were about to be a six seed in the Mountain West tournament had UNM beat Utah State on Saturday night, which we did, we know did not happen at this point. Um, but the fact that it came down to the, the final two games of the entire season in the conference for a, a team as good as San Diego State to know that um, was pretty wild. I am uh, I will go over the scores real quick. Uh, I'm not going to really recap uh, too much uh, of of the game action earlier in the day on Saturday, but Colorado State did beat Air Force at Air Force, 82 to 73, and that set up had they lost. New Mexico would have clinched at least the sixth seed. Um, as it turns out, New Mexico later clinched the sixth seed with some other tiebreakers. Uh, Wyoming went to Fresno State, ended probably the last home game of, of Justin Hudson's career out at Fresno State. We'll see. Um, I don't think anything official has been named or said yet, but uh, Wyoming went out to Fresno State and beat up on the Bulldogs 86-47. to And all of that set up. Two games left in the Mountain West on Saturday night starting with the New Mexico Lobos at number 22, Utah State. We find out Jamal Mashburn Jr. comes down with the flu Saturday morning. He went to team shoot-around in Logan on Saturday morning, uh, was feeling sick. They sent him back to the hotel, wanted to keep him away from, from other players. He wasn't feeling any better by game time. First time in 18 Mountain West games that the Lobos changed their starting lineup. Uh, Jamal Mashburn Jr. stayed back at the team hotel. They inserted Jamal Baker Jr. into the starting lineup. And while the offense was going just fine for the Lobos, statistically speaking, and I wrote about this in the Emptying the Notebook, um, statistically speaking, the offense has been very good when Jamal Masperin Jr. and the starting lineup, the starting five players, are playing together. They, did, they weren't quite as good at Utah State. Now, that doesn't mean the defense um, hasn't suffered when, when the Lobos are starting a six-foot point guard, a six-foot two uh, two guard and a six foot two small forward, essentially, especially when they're playing bigger teams. That that three spot when Jamal Mashburn Jr. is six foot two and having to guard six foot seven, you know, Chibuzo Ogbo at uh, Boise State and things like that. That's where the Lobos have really struggled playing these three guards. But it's not offensively. Um, they're they're efficient. They're scoring a lot of points. They've been doing pretty well, even without Mashburn in the lineup on Saturday night. Offense wasn't the issue on on Saturday in Utah. Uh, defense might have been a little bit. It was the first time in the entire season uh, the Lobos actually shot better than 50%. They shot 52% in the game. It was the first time they shot over 50% this season and lost a game. Um, rather than going over the entire game, the entire stat sheet, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward to the final minute of the game when it was all scored or is all tied up at 82-82 and 45 seconds to go when Utah State's Ian Martinez did this. It's Martinez, open and run with, oh, and Utah State leads by two. All right, well, that makes it 84-82 in favor of Utah State with, uh, like I said, as of 45 seconds to go, Jalen House, who had been taking it from the herd, the student section at Utah State, all game, uh, responds with this ankle-breaking move um, and this crossover. And then a mid-range jumper, kind of like his friend back at the hotel, Jamal Mashburn Jr. is pretty famous for. But uh, Jamal Mashburn, or Jalen House rather, uh, answers and ties the game back up at 84 with 36 seconds left on this move. 40 seconds left. House, the jumper. Oh, so that sets up in the tie game, 84-84. Utah State gets to drop the last play. They want to run the clock as best they can, and they do. And they turn to the senior Point guard Darius Brown the second, and the final moments. Great Osabar actually had the ball in the post. Uh, Might have traveled. He did travel. Uh, didn't get called. Um, that's fine. That happens a lot. Uh, but after a slight uh, shuffling of the feet in the paint, he kicks it back out to Darius Brown, and Darius Brown hits this NBA range three over the outstretched hands of Jalen House, and just a dagger three pointer that Darius Darius Brown has now done four, maybe five times this year. He is Mr. Clutch in the Mountain West. It's Brown, Osibor down low, three to shoot, Osibor out to Brown, the senior for three. Oh! Darius Brown with 
And yet, that three-pointer didn't quite end things. Uh, Lobos inbound the ball. They had 4.2 seconds left. Inbound the ball. Get fouled with 2.8 seconds left. Jalen House does. Utah State up 87-84, up by three points. So they foul intentionally. So UNM goes to shoot a free throw. Um, they want to make it. And they want to intentionally miss the second, but off the rim. So then they have a chance at getting a rebound, a putback, maybe force overtime. That was the plan. And as you can see here, the first part of that is Jalen House has to hit that first free throw while the herd and 10,270 fans at the D. Glenn Smith Spectrum uh, sold out venue, just one of the loudest games I've been to this year. They're all chanting, Jalen sucks. Jalen sucks. Calm as can be. Jalen sinks the first free throw. And then the second free throw that he tries to intentionally miss and throw as hard as he can off the front of the rim misses the rim entirely, hits the backboard, and comes back, which should pretty much be a dead ball. The referees are supposed to blow the blow the ball dead right then, and uh, the clock should never have started. If it doesn't hit the rim on a free throw, it's a dead ball. Other team gets the inbound. Instead, players are standing around. Jalen House, you'll see in this video, even turns around because he knew he didn't hit the rim. Everybody in the arena knew that he didn't hit the rim, except three officials. So, they let the clock run out. They let the crowd run, rush the court. It wasn't the crowd's fault. The clock ran out and the referees signaled the game was over. So, the crowd then rushes the court. Utah State wins 87 to 85. Uh, outright Mountain West champions. Congratulations to Utah State for doing so. Let's look at that final sequence, though. <laughs> And as I said, the uh, the final sequence there, um, I did ask, uh, as you're allowed to at some of these games, um, you're allowed to, to ask the lead official for a clarification on a rule or a ruling, or in this case, a lack of a ruling, why they walked off the court while Richard Pitino was sort of looking for him and, and trying to figure out what why did the game end. Um, this is the statement that they put out uh, later that day. They um, Not later that day, later that night, they, they put out the statement, and it read from the lead official, um, head official Mike Littlewood, who said, quote, and this was after the journal, after I asked them for a comment, uh, quote, we did not notice on the court that the ball did not hit the rim. So we let play continue until the game clock expired. So a uh, weird way to end. Probabilities are the Lobos still had very little chance. It would have been 2.8 seconds left with Utah State inbounding the ball with a two-point lead. If the Lobos don't come up with the steal in a quick layup or a quick bucket, um, they have to foul. Gives uh, Utah State with a two-point lead a chance to go up by three or four. Um, odds are they're not going to win anyway. Still, you'd rather see a game that good finish without the officials kind of messing up. And they did. They messed up. So uh, I did ask today, we, we spoke with the UNM earlier today, and I did ask Richard Pitino um, if he had any communication with the league offices about it and uh, just sort of what he thought of that final sequence at the Utah State game on Saturday night. I know the outcome, the probability of the outcome changing is very, very low, but they did blow a call at the end of the game Saturday night. Have you had any contact? With Substantially low, Jeff. I don't think they're going to change the yeah, outcome of it. Um, they obviously screwed it up. Now, to sit here and say it cost us the game, obviously is an exaggeration because we still would have had to get a steal score. Like, the, the probability of all of it turning into a win, I, I just was very surprised they didn't see it. Um, but they made a mistake. 
Uh, I don't think it's why we lost. It was very confusing. Uh, at first, when Howe shot it, I was like, what, what did he just do? But then I'm sitting there going, well, what if we had rebounded and made the shot? Would they have counted it? Um, and then all of a sudden, it should have been two point whatever seconds, and all of a sudden the fans rushed the court. Would that have been a technical? You know, those are things you wonder. Um, but I don't, I don't think it cost us the game. Uh, we communicated with the uh, conference. Uh, I've been coaching for 12 years. I find communicating with conferences to be the biggest waste of time ever, and I think the people at the Big Ten were great, and I think the people at the Mountain West are great. Nothing really changes. Uh, you know, like, I don't wish ill will on the three refs who screwed it up. I mean, it just, I don't think it's why we lost the game. I'm just very surprised that three guys didn't see it, didn't hit the rim. Uh, but none of us were perfect that night. All right, well, there you go. You, there's Richard Pertino commenting on um, the ending of that Utah State game. And, and believe me, he, he's well aware that the odds of the Lobos, um, had they got the call right, the odds of the Lobos winning that game were, at that point, were very slim. He just kind of like most people, I, I think, wishes the game wouldn't have ended on a referee error. You, you want a game that great to end because the players ended the game. Um, so that sets up, uh, obviously, the outright championship for Utah State. Again, congratulations to the Aggies, their first outright Mountain West championship. And in the first year of Danny Sprinkle, head coach, uh, who took over a program that had zero returning points and assists, nothing returning from last year's roster. He did have some players that redshirted and stuff like that, but not one point returned from last year's roster. Um, wins an outright championship in, in what might have been the greatest year of Mountain West basketball. Congratulations to him. Congratulations to that team. Sets up uh, then a game between UNLV and Nevada where if Nevada wins, they get to the two-seed spot. And if UNLV wins, they get to the two-seed spot. Um, so still a lot to play there. San Diego State at this point um, had already clinched the five. New Mexico, by losing to Utah State, had already clinched the six, so they know they're playing uh, on the Wednesday, uh, the first day of the, the conference tournament instead of the quarterfinal round that starts on Thursday. So uh, Nevada ends up beating UNLV, sweeping UNLV this year in their in-state rivalry, 75-65, to 65, and uh, Steve Alford had a interesting comment afterwards that uh, kind of just to, to poke a little bit, poke the bear a little bit with Utah State. The, the league's unbalanced 18-game schedule Utah State did not play, did not host UNLV this year, and they did not play at Nevada this year. Every team in the league in the 18-game unbalanced schedule um, misses one road game against one opponent and one home game against one opponent every year, and then they play everybody else twice. Well, the two teams that the league champion missed this year are Nevada and UNLV, who went into Saturday night, the final night of the regular season, as the two hottest teams. One was, I think, riding... 10 of 11 games had won in a row for Nevada, and I believe uh, UNLV had won 11 of 12 going into that game. So um, unfortunate that that happened. The, the league is already fixing it. They're, they're going to a 20-game balance schedule next year. Everybody will play everybody in a true round-robin format home and away, so this doesn't happen anymore. Doesn't take away the outright championship of Utah State. Uh, they deserve it. They were great. They did the schedule they wanted or they, that they had placed in front of them. But... Uh, for those that follow this podcast and follow Lobo Basketball, probably not too surprising that Steve Alford wanted to make sure he was on the record as saying this. Phenomenal job. And uh, hats off, congratulations to Utah State uh, for winning the league. Uh, we do also know, um, Utah State, you did not come to Law Hart. But congratulations on the league title. Um, but I All right, so there you go. There's Steve Alford uh, making sure everybody knew that Utah State, the league champion, did not come to Lawler. Uh, did not visit Reno this year, so that sets up the final standings and then the seedings, which we will get to in just a moment, but the final standings in the Mountain West Conference, you can see on your screen there. Um, I will run through them, uh, especially for you guys listening to this podcast. First place, Utah State did finish with a 14-4 and record, which, uh, again, improbable because they were a preseason number nine team in the preseason Mountain West poll in the 11-team conference. Nevada and Boise State finished with the same record. They finished in a tie for second place at 13 and 5. Nevada with tiebreakers is the 2 seed in the Mountain West tournament and Boise State is the 3 seed. In fourth place was UNLV, finishes at 12 and 6. And then that 5 seed, fifth place San Diego State, the defending champs and and again the national runner up last year made that nice run to the final four in national title game. They finishes the 5 seed and an 11 and 7 record. Now we're talking 
The teams that start on Wednesday, team seeds 6 through 11, uh, UNM Lobos and Colorado State finished tied for 6th. The 6th seed goes to UNM and their 10 and 8 record because of tiebreakers. Colorado State at 10 and 8 finishes um, with the 7th seed. That is the uh, your top 7 seeds. Those are the 7 seeds uh utah state nevada boise state unlv san diego state new mexico and colorado state that most think still have a chance to either win the tournament or and get into the ncaa tournament as well so that's where we're at but these other four still obviously um want to have a say in that that's wyoming at eight and ten they will be playing fresno state four and fourteen uh that's the eight and nine seeds and then tied uh, at the bottom, San Jose State two and sixteen, Air Force two and sixteen. That's your ten. And the, that's your eleven seed uh, for those two. So, those are the final standings for the Mountain West season. And on Monday, again, as I'm recording this, this is Monday night now, March eleventh. Also on Monday, the Mountain West media um, released its all conference team, its all conference awards, its postseason awards and all conference team. Um, the coaches come out with theirs on Tuesday. They do it through the league. We do it independent of the league. And, uh, it's something I've been putting together for about six or seven years now, uh, after the coaches decided to kick the media out of the post game or the postseason awards, never talked to us uh, with us about it. They just booted us out one year. They asked us to do the preseason one, didn't want us in the postseason one anymore after we started to figure out that um, sometimes the coaches uh, weren't nominating players for awards. And we, we could only vote back then on who was nominated or who was on the ballot. And certain teams, we didn't want to for whatever the reason, whatever agenda coaches sometimes have. Uh, some coaches weren't even nominating their own players for awards. And uh, when that started to, to leak out and reporters started to make comments about that, uh, the coaches got sick of it, decided we don't need the media as a part of this anymore. So since they've kicked us out, we've kept it going by doing our own. Uh, the official recognized league um, poll is the coaches poll. And uh, that's fine. Uh, I know the Mountain West wants to be one of the power conferences, and especially in basketball. And with the Pac-12 dissolving, um, you know, it wants to take over the West. Uh, a lot of the power conferences let the media be a part of the poll. So Maybe the Mountain West will will come around to that again. Uh, they do not they do not like uh, the appearance of being a small time league. So we'll see if they keep this up or not. But for now, the media poll that came out on Monday that we released um, looked like this. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run down the uh, the all conference teams, and then I'm going to finish up with the individual awards. And I can already tell you, I, I kind of have an idea of what the coaches' poll is going to look like on Tuesday when it comes out. Um, there are some differences. Uh, I think it'll be interesting. I, I will point out that the media poll, we put all our vote totals out there so you can see it. So everybody can understand exactly why this guy was the last guy on first team. And this guy was the last or top guy on second team, how diff how close the voting even was. We do the same for all the individual awards. So there's no, uh, no hidden agendas, no nothing secret about this. Every, every person from every, there's one vote for every market, all 11 markets, just like the coaches poll has one coach for all 11 teams. The media poll has one market and markets where there are multiple media representatives that are taking part in this poll. Um, they have to have one combined ballot. Every market gets one vote. And as such, um, it's kind of hard to have ties between two players uh, in an 11 team league. So um, it'll be interesting to see if the, the coaches poll has ties between two players um, and how they get there with 11 coaches. But we'll see. That'll come Tuesday. For now, this is uh, running down the all conference teams. For the media selections, all Mountain West first team um, was Jaden Ledee, Gray Osabar from uh, Utah State, guard Isaiah Stevens from Colorado State, forward Tyson Dagenhart from Boise State, and Jared Lucas from Nevada. That's your first team all Mountain West media selection postseason awards. Your second team, Darius Brown from Utah State, Keenan Blackshear from Nevada, Donovan Dent from New Mexico, JT Toppin from New Mexico, Jalen House from New Mexico, and Deedon Thomas from UNLV. Now, what's inter interesting there, and you can see, is the, the point totals show you that uh, Jalen House and Deedon Thomas, um, DJ Thomas is what he goes by, both had 63 votes. So we did have a se uh, six-team, second, six-player second team there. And what's also interesting and very rare in the 25-year history of the Mountain West Conference is that two freshmen, JT Toppin and Deedon Thomas, DJ Thomas, um, made second team. You don't see freshmen make all conference at all most years. You definitely don't see two of them on the second team very often. So those two guys are both great. 
um, in third team action or in third team selection. Boise State's Omar Stanley, Wyoming's guard, Wyoming guard Sam Griffin, Air Force forward Ritus Petritus, Nick Davidson forward from Nevada, and Jamal Mashburn Jr. from New Mexico round out your third team. Honorable mentions, um, a lot of them. We had 26 players in all uh, got votes for the all-conference media team, and you can take a look at them there, or you can go to abqjournal.com slash sports and look at our all-conference team. But now let's look, take a look at the individual awards and um, – superlatives that the both the coaches poll will put out and we and the media put out as well player of the year Jaden Ladee San Diego State he was in my mind he did get my vote as well but the media gave him seven of the 11 first place votes and Utah State Darius Brown second and Gray Osobar got the other vote what's interesting here is there is a lot of people there are a lot of people in basketball that believe the best player or most important player on the best team always deserves player of the year in a league. Um, San Diego State's actually really kind of um, led the charge on that a lot of years when they've had some great teams that have won championships, but they were so balanced that it was hard to pick out one player or one star. And here we are with Jaden Ledee, San Diego State, easily winning player of the year in the media poll in a year that San Diego State is the five seed. So I do think it was clear Jaden Ledee, um, who, who just couldn't be defended by, by most teams without just fouling him like crazy. Uh, he, he's an All-American level player. I do think he separated himself enough to, to earn this award, even if you believe in general that the best player on the best team should win it. In this case, Jaden Ledee was that much better than everybody that I think he deserved it. So Coach of the Year, this one, the surprise here to me is just that it wasn't unanimous. Danny Sprinkle, Utah State. Steve Alford did a tremendous job at Nevada. What Danny Sprinkle did this year is National Coach of the Year worthy, and uh, he will be getting some consideration for that. So I thought this should have been unanimous Coach of the Year for Danny Sprinkle, but he got 10 of the 11 votes. Defensive Player of the Year, Jalen House gets four votes. This one was close, man. Um, Lamont Butler, San Diego State, got three votes. I, uh, I would have been fine with... Any one of these top three guys, actually, I think really had a, a good case for this. Trey Coleman being the third um, from Nevada. Uh, JT Toppin, the freshman for the Lobos, and uh, Luis Rodriguez, Luis Rodriguez um, for Nevada, uh, I'm sorry, for UNLV, um, also got a vote each. Very good defensive players. Um, but I, I think those top three, Jalen House, Lamont Butler, Trey Coleman, really deserved uh, consideration for the top player, defensive player of the year. And uh, in my mind, Jalen House, what he did... <clears throat> earlier in, in conference play when, when the Lobos were really hot and had that five-game win streak, that, that's when he cemented it to me. Um, maybe fell off a little bit, but it was a big picture. It wasn't just what he did in the last couple of weeks. It was what he did over the 18-game conference season. Newcomer of the year, great also bar for Utah State. Great season. His teammate, Darius Brown, uh, gets the other three votes um, out of the 11 votes that were cast. Freshman of the year, JT Toppin does a edge. DJ Thomas for UNLV from UNLV. Eight to three, six man of the year. We uh, in the media poll did have a tie, four votes apiece for Josh Udeje from Utah State and Mustafa Amzil from New Mexico. With freshman, a, a very good freshman by the way, Cam Meniawu, um, I believe is how he pronounces the last um, name for Wyoming. Got three votes, so really, uh, really good six men of the year as well in this league this year. So there you go. There's the media poll results and i again the coaches poll comes out on tuesday we'll see how different it is i think there's going to be a lot of similarities in the all conference teams i think there might be some uh some uh, differences in the individual awards that that people will be interested in is is all i'll say there so that takes us to to what we're really here for right the mountain west conference tournament starts on wednesday and uh this tournament's up for grabs it's wide open wow. and when i say wide open i i'm telling you there are uh, very good probabilities that the, the people in Vegas who, who make a lot of money at um, predicting these things and sports gamblers who, who make a lot of money with the math and the, the numbers and the computers that uh, pump out the probabilities for these things are showing that uh, this, this is a very much a wide open Mountain West tournament with as many as seven teams having pretty good numbers pretty good probabilities uh to win this thing if if you look at the the website this is uh full credit going to teamrankings.com for pumping out these mountain west championship conference uh mountain west conference championship information um odds and probabilities but it, it, anyway if you look at what they're predicting right now on this chart on your screen there 
the, uh, the this is the probabilities to advance to each round. You'll see that that five of those teams have a hundred percent probability to advance to the quarterfinals because they all start in the quarterfinals, right? But New Mexico, it, what's interesting here is New Mexico's the sixth seed, and there's never been a team that played that first day the outside of the top five seeds that played in that first day that, that won this Mountain West tournament in this format. So it is interesting to me that the six seed New Mexico has the third highest probability um, percent chance to win based on how the bracket lays out and plays out based on their Ken Palm metrics and, and all the metrics that go into these things, their offensive and defensive efficiency numbers and all that, also based on who other teams are playing and, and how hard it is for them to advance on their side of the bracket. So according to TeamRankings.com, the favorite to win the Mountain West Tournament is going to be San Diego State at 18.89%. The second favorite is the one seed, the, the league regular, seeds, regular season champion, Utah State, at 16.98%. But then there's number three, New Mexico, 15.24%. And then there's a little bit of a, a drop to the fourth team. That's Nevada, UNLV, the four seed, playing in their home arena. Not technically their home court because they do bring in a new a new court for the Mountain West tournament. But um, in their home arena, UNLV is all the way down there is the, the fifth predicted uh in terms of probability the the fifth highest probability of winning this tournament on teamrankings.com and then there's Boise State a team I think at, at any given point of this uh regular season anyway that you might have looked at Boise State and thought they're the best team playing right now so um it, it's interesting they're the sixth seed uh, or the sixth highest probability to win this thing Colorado State again who entered Mountain West play back in January with the highest ranking in the AP poll. Had a good offseason. Really, frankly, pedestrian uh, play in, in conference play. They are the seventh seed, and they are the seventh uh, in terms of probability of winning this thing. Still a pretty good number for a 7 out of 11 team probability to win this thing because there's a huge drop-off after that. Wyoming, Fresno State, San Jose State, Air Force... All four of those teams are under 1% chance of winning the Mountain West Tournament, whereas the top seven are between 9% and 19%. So uh, really fascinating numbers. If you ask me, um, that that kind of stuff just sort of fascinates me, and uh, I think it'll be interesting. Uh, New Mexico sure could use this 50% uh, this number and get into the semifinals. If they get to the semifinals, they're in the NCAA Tournament because they, they would have had some quality wins uh, to get there. So um, those are interesting. Let's get rolling now on uh, some game-by-game, -game, uh, brief game-by-game -game capsules for the first day on Wednesday, and then I'll give you my overall view of um, maybe some teams I think that, that could advance or some games I want to watch uh, matchup-wise if, if they do play out. Um, first game coming up on Wednesday's first round of the men's tournament is uh, the 8-9 game. That's between number 8 Wyoming and number 9 seed fresno state uh what's interesting is these two teams knew they were the eight and the nine they were the first two teams locked in seed wise about two weeks ago now and it was that way for i want to say a good 10 days or so um where these two teams knew they were going to be playing each other and they finished the regular season on saturday against one another so it was interesting because wyoming just absolutely blew out Fresno State uh, in Fresno on Saturday, 86 to 47. When these two teams played earlier in the season in January in Laramie, it was a 68 67 Wyoming win. Fresno State had every opportunity uh, to, to win that game. Wyoming was fortunate to, to win on their home court. So, very different game. Um, it, it should be noted Saturday, we, we just we don't know. First of all, um, Fresno State's very injury. Um, hit, hit with the injury bug quite a bit these last few weeks. So I don't know if that was just a team kind of out of gas and, and out of bodies or if they just didn't want to show much. They're, they Why why show everything you can do on Saturday when you know you're going to be playing them in the conference tournament just a few days later? So uh, I wouldn't read too much into the 86-47 blowout of Fresno State. I, I will note that, um, first of all, Wyoming, um, as, as, as I just said, 2-0 in the regular season against Fresno State. They're led by two transfer guards, Aquel Cott and Sam Griffin. Sam Griffin, as I mentioned earlier, third-team all-conference player this year. Those two guards are, are both really good uh, compared to the, around the whole league. They, they would be – they give fits to the whole league. They're very good guards. 
Uh, also, uh, Mason Walters, last year, 2023 NAIA Player of the Year. And uh, he's a forward, versatile forward that um, has been pretty good for them this year. And uh, I, I really think, <clears throat> frankly, the, the X factor for Wyoming, if, if they make any kind of run here, and, and when they're dangerous, I think it's Brendan Wenzel. Their, their forward is a really good three-point shooter. And his second half of his season, if you look at his splits between you know, November and December compared to January and February, uh, the, the guy's a really good player. Uh, turned it on second half of the season for them. I like Brendan Wenzel a lot, a really good forward who, who as I said, can shoot from the outside. As far as, um, well, l let me add this. They are ranked uh, 15 and 16 was their their overall record this year for the Wyoming Cowboys with head coach Jeff Linder, and they are ranked in Ken Palm 153rd, 153 in Ken Palm for Wyoming. Um, as far as Fresno State goes, they, look, they were in the pit just a week ago, senior night for the Lobos. Uh, a lot of people watching or listening to this that are Lobo fans may have been there or followed that game and uh their their best player is isaiah hill he's a guy that got ejected from the from the lobo game didn't play pretty much the second half um it is a team as i mentioned just ravaged by injuries lately especially these past few weeks uh and yet even with all those injuries they had league champion utah state beat basically at the end of regulation in fresno two weeks ago and darius brown banks in a three-pointer at the buzzer uh, at the end of regulation to tie the game. They were down three with just a few seconds left and about 40 feet out, for, a lot further than the three-pointer he hit against the Lobos on Saturday night that uh, that we saw earlier in this podcast. Uh, he, he banks in the three-pointer in regulation, forces overtime. Uh, 40, I think this was a game, not I think, it was a game where Fresno State's five starters all played 40 or more minutes. That They were down to six scholarship players, I think it was. Uh, Isaiah Hill, their best player, fouled out in the overtime period. He played like 44 minutes and then fouled out. But yeah, five starters played 40 or more minutes. Hard to do in a 40-minute game, but when you have the five-minute overtime, uh, th that's how that happened. So Fresno State is scrappy. I, I do think, uh, again, nothing's really been announced, but it, it looks like the contract that's about to expire of Justin Hudson, the head coach there, um, is, is going to expire. They, If they wanted him back, they, they certainly could have um, handled this a lot differently and probably should have, frankly, handled it a lot differently, but they didn't. They they didn't extend him. Uh, he, it's impossible to recruit for next year when you don't have a contract through Wednesday at this point for, for Justin Hudson. So this may be the last go-around for Justin Hudson at Fresno State, and that's unfortunate. Um, it's, uh, it is the business though. And we'll see how they, how they go out, uh, go out swinging for, for him and, and for themselves as well. Uh, Fresno state is a team that probably needs three pointers to, to win. Uh, their offense hasn't been very good this year, especially in league play. They're ranked 11th out of 11 in, in just about everything. When you look at Ken Palm, they do need some three pointers to, to win. The problem is they, they only shot 33% in league play. Uh, from beyond the arc. The one exception to that, though, I will say, is Xavier Ducell. Uh, shot 39% from three. He's a very good three-point shooter. Also happens to be a transfer from Wyoming from last year. So I like uh, Isaiah Hill's a good point guard. I think Isaiah Pope, a uh, transfer from Utah Tech, uh, formerly Dixie State. Uh, he, he's a pretty good piece of the puzzle for, for Fresno State as well. I like those guards. Xavier Ducell can get hot from the outside and, and knock down some shots. And they'll need it if they want to if they want to beat Wyoming in this one in this eight nine game. The winner of this eight nine game between Wyoming and Fresno State gets number one seed Utah State at noon Pacific, one p.m. Mountain Time on Thursday in the quarterfinal round. And Utah State's four zero against these guys. Uh, one of the reasons Utah State won the league championship is they they didn't slip up against anybody in the bottom of the standings. Um, they it's going to be tough, I think, for either one of these teams to to beat Utah State. However, I, I just got done talking about Fresno State found a way to force overtime and, and really had them beat. So it can happen. It, it certainly can happen. And uh, we'll see how that goes. First matchup, first game of the Mountain West Tournament is this one, 8-9 game between Wyoming and Fresno State. All right, well, let's move on to game two now on Wednesday in the first round of the Mountain West Tournament. Number seven seed Colorado State Rams. And the number 10 seed, San Jose State. This game's going to be played at 1.30 p.m. Pacific. They're in Las Vegas. And 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Again, streamed on the Mountain, Nest, the Mountain West Network, the MW.com, is how you get all the first day games. Uh, what's interesting to me is uh, 10 seed 
10 seed um, San Jose State coach, Tim Miles. Sorry about that. Uh, Tim Miles is a former Colorado State coach, so obviously there's some fami familiarity here. And um, I, I, they only played once in the regular season, but it's not like these two teams don't know each other well. And uh, the coaches certainly know each other well as, um, also. But the one time they did play this year, the Rams won by 19 points. Wasn't wasn't much of a game. Neat Clifford had a, an 11 point, 11 rebound double double for the Rams. Isaiah Stevens had a 9 point, 11 assist game, and uh, th this is a, a Rams team that that was rolling that night. And when when its offense is is going, it has a, a very balanced attack led by one of the the most. Um, respected and um has a ton of records five fifth year point guard one of the best point guards in, in mountain west history and it's 25 years in isaiah stevens who, who wants to go out so he doesn't want to go out on a wednesday uh afternoon in in the first round of the mountain west tournament so uh i expect the rams to come out playing pretty well uh they, they it is a good matchup i think uh against san jose state uh, it's not just the Isaiah Stevens show. Uh, Patrick Hardy is very good. Joel Scott, Neat Clifford, they have a balanced attack. And, and when they're rolling, their offense is very balanced. KenPalm.com sees this as a 15-point Colorado State Rams win. And the, the Rams need it. Uh, they, they better win. Uh, right now, they are in every bracket projection. They are kind of that next four in. They're, they're one of the five or six teams that, that are in. But I'll tell you what, you lose to San Jose State, it's not just like you didn't do anything to improve your your uh, NCAA tournament resume, but you, you lose on Wednesday, that's a bad loss that you're you're picking up right before the tournament. So not not a good look if uh, if they stumble on Wednesday. I don't think they will, but um, if they do, it's because San Jose State has, has some pretty good guards themselves. MJ Amy, Myron Amy, very dynamic guard. He can attack the rim, and he's, he's hard to guard. He can go find his own shot at any time. Uh, end of the shot clock, that kind of stuff. And, of course, I, I think Al Alvaro Cardenas is, is one of the most steady point guards because he's on a team with a bad record, and, and you know that that's how it goes in these things. Uh, I don't think a lot of people know about him, but he's a, he's a really good point guard. I do think they have two two good guards in, at San Jose State that uh, if those two guys are, are, are playing really well, though, uh, Alvaro will control the game and the tempo and, and kind of... I don't want to say hold his own or, or do better than Isaiah Stevens, but he he's not gonna he's not gonna be the weakness uh, for the for the Spartans. That's for sure. And uh, Myron Amy, when he gets going, he he can really get going. So uh, San Jose State has a shot. Uh, it, I don't think it's going to be uh, just a, an entire blowout. I don't think they're just going to fold. But um, the Rams should win this game when when their offense is clicking. They're they're balanced. Um, all that said, for, for those who haven't been paying attention, during league play, Colorado State was number three in defense. And it is their defense, I think, that's uh, maybe most impressive lately. And in league play, they were number one against two-point uh, field goal percentage. I, I was looking at Ken Palm uh, for, uh, about this game earlier, and let me pull it up again. The... The interesting thing, again, I think people think of the Rams and they think of that offense. I've said it multiple times here already that they're spread it out and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, they were number in conference play, number three in defensive efficiency, and uh, number one, they're they're allowing teams only to shoot forty six point five percent on two point baskets. So their their defense is good. And on the other side, I think San Jose State, um, you know, if they could get some. If their defense can slow down Isaiah Stevens, they have a chance. Um, but the the spreading it out and, and hitting these open shots that the Rams sometimes can do when they get rolling, it, it's tough because San Jose State's defense, not only were they dead last in conference play, let's see, in against a three-point shot, they allowed 39.1% three-point shooting this year, which ranks 361st out of 362 Division One teams. So they're second worst in the entire country at three-point shooting, that was overall this season. When you get into conference play only, the percentage was even worse. They allowed teams to shoot 42.4% on three-pointers this year. So uh, they're not defending that arc very well. And, and if Colorado State, gets, Colorado State gets rolling from the outside, uh, the, the game probably could get out of hand. So um, obviously that's not what Tim Miles and San Jose State 
wants, and we'll we'll see how it goes. The winner of that game on Thursday advances to the quarterfinals to play the two seed Nevada, who I think's probably playing as good. Uh, not probably. Uh, you'll you'll hear my overall projections here in just a couple minutes, and uh, I think Nevada's the best team in the league right now, playing the best right now, and they are two and zero against San Jose State in the regular season. They won by thirty and they won by twenty one, and they're also two and zero against the Rams. They won by thirteen in Reno, and then just two weeks ago on February seventeenth, the same night, Darius Brown had that banked in three pointer to force overtime against Fresno. Like as those two things were happening at the same time, as as he was hitting that shot and forcing overtime, Jared Lucas was hitting a, a half court three pointer in Fort Collins and Moby Arena to beat Colorado State and Nevada won that game by three points. So um it, it was a close one in Fort Collins at least. But uh Colorado State, you know, they haven't won outside of Moby other than Fresno State and Air Force, two of the three bottom teams in this league. They haven't went outside of Fort Collins since December, so they need this one. Um, they can't pick up another bad loss. I do think the Rams will probably take care of this one in advance to Thursday to play the number two seed Nevada Wolfpack. Okay, well, let's move on to the final matchup of Wednesday's opening round of the Mountain West Tournament, the number six seed UNM Lobos, number 11 Air Force Falcons. Uh, a lot of you who, who are listening to this are obviously Lobo followers, maybe Lobo fans, and uh, any of you who are 45 minutes into this podcast and were really just here to hear what I thought about the first round matchup between the Lobos and the Air Force Falcons, thank you for sticking around. Um, if, uh, if you didn't want to listen to all that other talking grammar, you're you're not hearing this, but uh, uh, here comes. Here's my breakdown of the first round matchup for the Lobos, which is a, an Air Force team that um, look. Th there's no reason to think that this game should be close. Uh, I think Ken Palm has a is predicting this game to be the com Ken Palm computers predict an 83-67 Lobos win, um, a comfortable victory for in in a tournament setting on a neutral court. And, of course, we all know that just a couple weeks ago, on February 24th, the Air Force beat the Lobos in the pit. It is the reason the Lobos are not in the NCAA tournament right now, um, more comfortably anyway, because they have that horrible loss. It's a quad four loss. The right now, as we speak, as I record this, the net rankings, um, the UNLV is up high enough where when the Lobos lost to UNLV at home, it was, for much of the season, uh, considered a quad three loss. But now it is a quad two loss. So the only blemish on UNM's resume right now in, in terms of bad losses, which are usually considered quad three is a bad loss. Quad four is a really bad loss. They have zero quad three losses. They have one quad four loss and it's Air Force. So um, you, now you can get into the NCAA tournament with quad four losses. A lot of teams have. In fact, right now, Florida Atlantic, last year's final four team, um, kind of the Final Four darling, if not for San Diego State beating them. Um, both of them were the darlings that got to the Final Four last year. But Florida Atlantic right now is projected to be comfortably in the field of 68. And um, in the NCAA tournament, they have two quad four losses. So it, it can happen. Uh, one quad four loss does not uh, an NCAA tournament resume kill. So um, the Lobos, though, can't do what they did, obviously against Air Force just two weeks ago in the pit. Um, Air Force is ranked, let's see, 259 in Ken Palm right now. They have a 9-21 and 21 record. They only went 2-16 and 16 in league play. But the, the head scratcher about Air Force right now is, for the first time, I think since 2003 or 2005 maybe, first time in a long time, they did not win a home game in league play this year. They did not win once in Clune Arena. But they do have the last place team in the Mountain West does have two quad one victories on the road. Not only did they beat UNM in the pit, one of the toughest places to win in this league, they beat UNLV in the Thomas and Mack Center where the conference tournament is, and they beat them by 32. They're, they're, they're averaging 32 points a win in the Thomas and Mack Center this year. No other team's doing that. So um, Air Force obviously can get rolling at times. They did against the Lobos for stretches. They did against UNLV the entire game. The reason they, when they can't, when, when they get rolling, they're a young team for Air Force um, Air Force standards, but uh, they do have some really good players, uh, really good players for, for Air Force. And I, I would tell you that, that right now, 
you know, when they beat the Lobos in the pit, they had five players in double score in double figures, and they can get that balance. They're not a very deep team, but what they do have is some some good starters. Ethan Taylor's good, I think, but but really forward Ritus Petritus is is uh, he's an all conference level guy. And uh, scored 15 against the Lobos. Hit the dagger three late in the game. Uh, JT Toppin missed an assignment. And uh, Ritus nails this open three-pointer. And Bo Becker also, he had two highlight reel dunks against the Lobos on some back screen cuts that the Lobos just almost forgot what they were doing against an Air Force team that's been doing those uh, those Princeton-style um, cuts for, for years. So uh, it, it was a game the Lobos really, really performed poorly in. And Ritus Petritus and, and Bo Becker made him pay. Bo Becker had 19 in that game in the pit. But let's also not forget that in that game, um, Air Force only shot 5 of 7 from the free throw line. They, they don't get to the line much. They're, they're not aggressive to the point where you foul them. So they're not going to get to the free throw line a lot. They, they really only play 5 or 6 deep on a regular basis. The, and the Lobos run a lot. Um, the Lobos did beat them handily earlier in the season. Um, the Lobos are better than them in every computer metric by leaps and bounds. And UNM, in the, in the same game, the, the Air Force only shot 5 of 7 at the free throw line. Well, UNM didn't exactly take great advantage of that because they were only 8 of 27 at the free throw line. They shot 20 more free throws, but uh, they missed 9 of them. And you lose a game by a point and... Miss nine free throws, that, that is an, an awful lot to do with it. So, um, worse than that, Air Force got rolling from the outside. They they hit 11 three-pointers, and eight of them were in the second half. They hit eight second-half three-pointers. UNM that game, when they lost in the pit, three of 16 overall. So, Air Force outscored UNM at the three-point line 33-9. to nine. And you're not going to beat a whole lot of teams when you lose the three-point shooting battle 33-9. to nine. And UNM is never going to, I shouldn't say never, this year they're not a great three-point shooting team. They don't take a whole lot of them, and, and they don't make a whole lot of them. But they got to be better than getting outscored 33-9 to against an Air Force team that uh, the, the Lobos should beat um, Wednesday. And there's, there's, there's a reason that, that UNM is still trying to play for an NCAA tournament, and Air Force is the last seed in this, in this conference tournament. So... Capable Air Force Falcons team, but the Lobos should uh, handle their business. Uh, projected to do so by 16, is that what? Yeah, 83, uh, 83 to 67 is what the KenPom.com computers project. Um, I don't know if it'll be that much, but I do think the Lobos should comfortably win, as they did earlier this year in Clune Arena. Um, we, we'll have to see what Jamal Mashburn Jr.'s health is like. He is a uh, he had he got the flu on Saturday, uh, the day of the Utah State game. Um, if he's back, good. He's he's had some pretty solid games against Air Force through the years. I want to say too that two guys they alternated, but two the Lobo Bigs had good games against Air Force too. In the loss in the pit, Nelly Junior Joseph, who who quietly has been maybe one of the best centers, maybe the best center in the entire conference lately. There's not a whole lot of true centers, a lot of really good power for forwards, but not a whole lot of true centers. So take that into consideration but Nelly might be the best center in the league right now and he is a guy that in the loss had 17 points nine rebounds three block shots and I think he has four double doubles in his last six games um JT Toppin didn't have a good game in the pit against Air Force but the first time they played him he had 25 points and 13 rebounds so the Lobos two big men each had a good game against Air Force this year and that's not to take you know not to totally forget the fact that Donovan Dent might be taking over not just for for the house and Mashburn show at UNM he might be taking the reins as the best guard in the league from Isaiah Stevens when Colorado State's Isaiah Stevens graduates at the end of the season I know DJ Thomas at UNLV the the freshman a lot of people are really high in him and they should be but Donovan Dent let's not forget um and I don't think he wants people to forget he uh he feels he might be the best guard in the league right now and uh, certainly wants to sort of carry that torch that is left for him from the two senior departing guards on, on the Lobos that, that he plays with right now and, and Isaiah Stevens. So um, I think he could have a good game. And one more little nugget on all this. Jalen House scored his career high at 42 points against Air Force. It was a couple years ago now, but same style of play. Um, when Jalen House gets rolling against this offense, uh, he he's a problem. And he can be a problem for Air Force. And um, I do think that the matchup, despite the fact they just lost in the pit to this Air Force team, 
I do think the matchup is just fine for the Lobos. We'll see. You know, uh, if they lose this, they're they're not in the NCAA tournament. Um, they they <laughs> don't deserve to be if they lose twice to Air Force. So we'll we'll see. I think this should be fine. The winner of this game, the winner of the 4 p.m. Uh, I guess this game is what Thursday. This game is Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Mountain. Again, streamed on the Mountain Net, the Mountain West Network, themw.com. And the 6-11 game, the winner um, plays Thursday in the quarterfinals against number three Boise State at 8:30 p.m. Pacific, 9:30 p.m. Mountain. That game will be on CBS Sports Network, and it's a late one. It's a late starting game, and Boise State has swept both Air Force and New Mexico this year, and has been a thorn in the side of, of the Lobos mainly because of their big physical play. And I, I think the the one person, maybe the one matchup in the league that kind of highlights the 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 weakness of the Lobos in starting three guards who are six foot tall, six foot two and six foot two is Boise State, who who starts Max Rice, Roddy Anderson. But at the three, you're starting a six seven Shibuzo Ogbo who who who's a really, really good small forward um in, in this league just overpowers whoever's defending him it's going to be one of those shorter guards and and he if if that's the matchup you you've got problems if you're if you're the lobos and maybe that highlights it better than any any other matchup in this league is is what boise state does to him so i don't think boise state is a team that the lobos can't beat by any stretch of the imagination they could have beat him in the pit max rice had a career game 35 points and was putting shots in like like crazy off balance shots um they held Tyson Dagenhart, statistically speaking, to to a pretty mediocre game in in the pit. I do think in Boise, Tyson was a lot better, and, and he's been kind of on fire, frankly, for the past 10 games or so, so really since that game. Throughout the month of February and in March, Tyson Dagenhart uh, elevated himself in case there was any question. There shouldn't have been, but in case there was, elevated himself back up to uh, a clear-cut first-team all-conference performer, and the... The guy I haven't mentioned yet for Boise State is Omar Stanley, the the St. John's transfer, who is a phenomenal defender, phenomenal pickup, phenomenal newcomer. Um, he, he's a he's a really good piece too for Boise State. So, if by chance the Lobos beat Air Force on Wednesday, they they face Boise State in that quarterfinal round. And now I'm just going to give an an overview of of the the conference tournament as a whole. I, I gave you the three first day matchups. Um, I find it interesting that in this Mountain West season, that it might be the best season ever for the Mountain West, that the conference tournament that everybody's looking forward to has three potential. I'm just playing chalk here. Um, if you actually, it doesn't matter if you play if you play chalk or not. Um, it's it doesn't matter who wins the the three first round games. It doesn't have to be the favorite. Three quarterfinal matchups are actually regular season sweeps. Utah State was two and zero against Wyoming. Swept Fresno State as well. The if you skip down to the two seed Nevada, they swept Colorado State and they swept San Jose State handily. Boise State swept New Mexico and swept Air Force handily. So three of these, like in this tournament where everybody says everybody's so equal and everybody's so close to each other and bunched up, three of them were regular season sweeps. I don't think the you know the the old saying is it's hard to team beat a team three times in a row. Well, yeah, you you play anybody enough times, it's, it's hard to keep beating them forever, but. You know, I will say that I do think Utah State should be their first round opponent, whoever it ends up being their quarterfinal opponent, whoever it is, Wyoming or Fresno State. I think that one's comfortable. I don't think Nevada and I don't think Boise State are going to have an easy go of it, assuming, and in this case, I'm going to assume chalk wins and, and seven seed Colorado State wins and six seed New Mexico wins. I don't think either one of those teams are going to get blown out by number two Nevada or number three Boise State just because the higher seed there, you know, swept them in the regular season. I think those are going to be good games. Um, let me let me back up and backtrack a little bit to that four five game, the UNLV San Diego State game. UNLV is playing as just about as hot as as anybody in this league, other than Nevada, who just beat them on Saturday night, of course, and swept that in state series. But UNLV. I'm pulling them up here right now. Uh, 19 and 11 overall, 72 in Ken Palm. The reason they're not in the NCAA discussion, although they're they're kind of on the outside sneaking sneaking up into the discussion a little bit, but they're not going to be in the NCAA tournament if they don't win this Mountain West tournament is pretty much the consensus opinion. Um, and the reason for that is is they lost their season opener on their home court to Southern 
by 14 points. Southern's ranked 257 in Ken Palm. They also lost um, in a semi-home game, which means they were playing in Henderson, um, to Loyola Marymount, who is 190 in Ken Palm. They've also lost to Air Force, 259 in Ken Palm, by 32 on their home court. Those are all horrible losses for, for any computer metrics. That's why they've played themselves out of NCAA consideration, despite the fact that if you look at what they've done since, let's see, this is January 27th. Since that Air Force loss, that 32-point home loss to Air Force, UNLV has won 10 of its last 12 games. The only two times UNLV has lost since January 23rd, when they lost by 32 to Air Force, has been to Nevada both in Reno and in Las Vegas, and Nevada is the best team in the league right now. So UNLV is playing pretty darn good, and that includes, in, in that span, that includes the win over New Mexico in the pit. Um, they also beat New Mexico in the Thomas and Mack Center earlier in the year. But they've beat San Diego State, too, just last week, last Tuesday. They beat San Diego State in the Thomas and Mack Center, and that was really a statement win. If if their 9 out of 10 at that point wins weren't enough to convince you, maybe their 10th win out of 11 games when they beat San Diego State, um, finally, and they hadn't beat San Diego State much in the last 5, 6, 7 years, um, they beat them 62-58 at home in a game that, that DJ Thomas, that the great freshman that they have, point guard, um, hit, hit a big shot late in the game to, to pretty much seal the deal, and he had... 19 points in that game against a San Diego State team that can shut down guards. And Lamont Butler's a really good defensive guard. Uh, Keelan Boone, the one of the two Boone brothers, um, had 16 points, 11 rebounds in that game, and four assists, also four blocks. I mean, UNLV has some pieces. So I do think this UNLV-San Diego State matchup is going to be a really, I mean, it's a toss-up. Um, San Diego State should win. But UNLV is playing fantastic. San Diego State has the best player in the league. But UNLV has, you know, one of the two best freshmen and, and up-and-coming stars, but also has two big men, brothers, Caleb and, and Keelan um, Boone, who, who are just fantastic. Um, Rob Ray, Whaley is Rob Whaley's playing fantastic, too. He's, he's a little bulldozer forward that uh, wastes well over 250, I, I, I think, and, and just is one of the strongest players in the league. I think UNLV has some pieces that can cause some problems for any team, but even one like San Diego State that likes to play physically. All that said, I, I do side lean a little bit with San Diego State winning that game um, and setting up what I think is going to be a potential, um, <laughs> a fun potential semifinal matchup between number one Utah State and number five San Diego State on Friday um, on CBS Sports Network. And the reason I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to this one and, and chuckling a little bit is is Jaden Ladee's the Mountain West media pick for for player of the year Danny Sprinkle Utah State's coach basically said I'm not voting in this thing again if if my guy doesn't win um if the best player on the best team or the most valuable player on the best team doesn't win um player of the year and I, I kind of think the coaches poll is going to have a Utah State player and I if it's not Darius Brown it's going to be great Osabar who is a great big man himself who had a phenomenal game when they beat San Diego State in Logan. Now, Jaden Ledee and Gray Osobar are, are those two big men going at it on that Friday semifinal game in the in the Mountain West Tournament, assuming that is the matchup. Man, that's going to be must must watch TV for, for Mountain West fans and people all over the country. So I look forward to that. Um, if that is the matchup, I, I'd probably lean towards the experience then of San Diego State to, to get back to the championship game. And uh, I, I, it's not that I don't think Utah State can beat them. I do. Utah State can absolutely win this whole thing. But I'm leaning there towards a San Diego State over Utah State win that gets San Diego State into the championship on the top half of the bracket. I, I will throw this out there. Um, if Utah State gets to the championship, I would love to see them play Nevada since Steve Alford made those comments reminding everybody that, yes, Utah State won the regular season title, but they didn't beat us in Lawler, as as Alford said. Um, so I would love to see those two play. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be San Diego State on the top half of the bracket, bottom half of the bracket. Let's go to that Nevada-Colorado State game. I think Jared Lucas and, and Keenan Blackshear um, are two great guards. I think Isaiah Stevens is a phenomenal guard. But uh, two's more than one. I, I think those two guards for, for Nevada, um, with a little bit of help of Trey Coleman on the defensive 
uh, side of things maybe slowing down somebody in Colorado State. If it's not Isaiah Stevens, maybe it'll be Trey, Nick Clifford or, or, or somebody else. But um, I, I think that Nevada's going to have too many scores um, that – even though Colorado State's defense has been so good, I just think Nevada's going to find a way to score. Remember, when Jared Lucas did beat, and Nevada did beat Colorado State in Moby uh, just a couple weeks ago with that half-court shot at the end of regulation, um, let's not forget that Keenan Blackjear didn't even play that game. So Nevada was not at full strength. Nevada, I just got done talking about how good UNLV's been in the last 12 games. They've won 10 out of 12. Well, Nevada is now at seven let's see 10 out of their last 11 and actually you could go the next step on them they've won 11 out of their last 12 since january 20th loss in laramie to wyoming the when i say they've won 11 out, or 11 out of the last 13 their two losses are to new mexico so um it's interesting that uh in the last dozen games for unlv they've only lost to one team but they've lost to them twice since nevada in Nevada's case, out of their last 13 games, they've won 11. The only team they've lost to twice is New Mexico. So Nevada's beaten everybody else. UNLV's beaten everybody else. Um, it's going to be... It's going to be a really interesting game. Obviously, Noodles and, and uh, Steve Alford know this tournament well, and, and they really love these tournament settings. And and I just think Nevada is going to be too much for, for Colorado State. And Nevada advances to the semifinals is my prediction. Uh, let's go down to that three seed Boise State and New Mexico matchup. Um, Boise State's not a great matchup for the Lobos. Uh, that said, I think the Lobos need this game so much more. I do think it's going to be hard to just keep beating them. Um, while the Lobos did get an overtime game over Boise State last year in the pit, uh, Boise State's had their number for the most part. And, and it's because they're, they're a better rebounding team. They're more physical. They're bigger. And they know how to use that to combat what the Lobos do well, which is quick, small guards that, that kind of attack you and do do the things. Boise State does the things that, that combat all that really well. I just, I think the Lobos um, need it more. And I think Donovan Dent is, is a guy that, if you get him in the pick and roll, is going to give Boise State some problems. And, and I think there will be, I think there will be some, some urgency to if that's working to keep going to it until Boise State stops it I also think that if Boise State and they're they don't think this but if if anybody thinks Jalen House is going to shoot two for where is it here two for 12 again like he did at Boise State a couple weeks ago in the loss that, that's just not going to happen Jalen House is in a shooting slump right now but he's a fifth-year senior who hasn't shot like this slump he's in, hasn't done that before. I don't think he just forgot how to shoot the basketball. So the odds of, of Jalen House not coming out of that slump are, are pretty slim. Lobos sure hope it's in the, one of the next few games um, for them, and, and the Boise State game would be a great one to do it at, in. So I do think the big men in at UNM can, can do enough to, to sort of combat the Omar Stanley, Cam Martin, Tyson Dagenhart um, front court. Uh, I, I say Lobo big men, meaning three of them now. Um, JT Toppin, sensational freshman. Nelly Jr. Joseph, who I already told you I think has been playing great. And, of course, Mustafa Amzil, co-six man of the year, has been playing great off the bench. I think those three big men can can kind of combat Boise State's four forwards, really, um, in Cam Martin, Omar Stanley, Tyson Dagenhart, and Chibuzo Agbo. So um, it, it, it'll be a great matchup. Man, if that Boise State-New Mexico matchup is what happens Thursday night, it'll be late, but it'll be maybe the best game of the day, I think, in the Mountain West Tournament in a, in a day of games that, that could all be great. If I'm leaning towards New Mexico gets that win and they have a rematch with Nevada in the semifinals, Lobo fans aren't going to like hearing this, but I'm, I'm so high on how good Nevada's playing now that I think that Alford and uh, and Noodles would probably get the Lobos in the semifinals on Friday. So that makes me think then uh, I'm leaning towards Nevada, a Nevada-San Diego State championship game on Saturday afternoon and Nevada winning it. So um, there you go. There are my picks for the upcoming Mountain West tournament. Uh, hope you enjoyed this long podcast. Uh, covered a lot of ground a lot of talking grammar on this episode of of talking grammar episode 83 
Uh, hope you liked it. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you enjoy our coverage. We're, we're going to be doing all week, uh, not just Lobo basketball. Remember, it's sports, high school sports, like crazy this week with, with the high school state tournament. James Yotis and crew do a phenomenal job with that. And uh, Ken Sickinger covering women's basketball has been doing phenomenal, too, with the Lobo women's team. Again, I want to thank TLC, Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, Electrical, for presenting this episode and for, for helping us out and bringing you these Talking Grammar podcasts. Um, I want to thank you, the, the listener, the viewer, however you're watching this. And, and if you can, subscribe to the Albuquerque Journal, digital or print, abqjournal.com slash subscribe. And, and we can't do this without you supporting local journalism. So hope you like this. Hope you enjoy uh, future episodes. And uh, it's going to be a fun week. And we'll see how uh, how long the Lobos keep playing. And, and not only this week, but beyond. And we'll see where they end up. So hope you like it. Let me know what you think. At Jeff Grammer on X. And you can always email me at ggrammer at abqjournal.com. And for now, uh, until next time, thanks for watching.